Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this, the fifth installation of our GNS 435-30 classes. Uh, have a great show for you tonight. Tonight, we'll be actually talking about shooting approaches with the Garmin 430 and 530 device. And teaching us tonight will be a man who by now needs no introduction, Captain Mike Jesh. Welcome. Ooh, that guy again? That guy again, man. He knows this <laughs> equipment. That's what I hear. Thanks, Brian. It's good to see you again and good to see the rest of you here. Looks like we're fast closing in on a thousand people here. Awesome. And uh, have we done this enough, Brian? Haven't we talked about everything about this navigator that we can talk about yet? I don't think so. I don't think you've even scratched the surface yet. I'm learning that there's oh, so geez. much more to learn about this. That's the one thing I've learned is how much more there is to learn. And I have learned more by, by hosting this and watching you teach this than, than I ever imagined I would. So I'm looking well, forward to it tonight. We'll make that circle expanding. And the problem is you expand that circle and it gets more surface area around the side. So you keep learning about new things you need to learn about. So, yeah. Uh, but what I've found is a lot of the questions that I get that we've gotten from the, all the previous episodes have to do with approaches. And in fact, there's one in the Q&A box right now that uh, is, is a recurring popular one. And uh, Roger, I will be getting to that question shortly. That's one of the things we'll talk about. And uh, Heath will, actually that'll come up here in just a second too. So let me, without any further ado here, I need to switch a couple of gears here and I need to share the proper screen if I can get to where I'm going. And we'll start the presentation in earnest here. Let me first... Uh, While he's actually, doing that, if you have questions, post them in the Q&A. We'll try to monitor the chat, but there's a lot going on there. And if I see questions I can answer, I'll go ahead and do so. If not, then, then we'll pass them on to Mike. So uh, one of the questions that I've gotten is kind of interesting, and, and you can see that screen that just says why, right, Brian? Yeah, I see it, yes. I posted the, a bunch of links today and a whole bunch of social media that this event was coming up tonight. And one person chimed in and said, geez, do I need to set my watch back to 1998? What's going on here? And uh, it, it's, it was kind of interesting. The 1998 is when the Garmin first came out with the GNS 400 and, and, or 430 and, and 530 non-WAS versions. And since then, I, I got to thinking, you know, there are a ton of these things out there. Um, I, I heard from an inside source today, there's well north of 100,000 of these units now that were produced. And that actually uh, is a little tidbit that came out of this news release from over 10 years ago, half the lifetime ago of the Garmin series, 430 series. Over 100,000 of these things were produced as of 10 years ago. And this was a few years before they came out with the GTN. And they are uh, no longer in production, so you, you can't buy a new GNS 430 or 530, but there are so many of them out there. Uh, we've had close to 10,000 people attend these webinars so far, and uh, the, the uh, recordings have been recorded over 25,000 times. So clearly there's a demand for this stuff out there. And those are you, the people who have their own airplanes are probably upgrading to the best of the latest and the greatest, but there are a lot of rental aircraft out there that still have this equipment in it. That's absolutely true. And uh, if, if you're buying an older airplane uh, and you, you take or you have an older airplane, maybe it hasn't been upgraded. This is a great way to kind of put your, your toe in the water and see how you like GPS navigators. And um, 430s and 530s can be handed, had in the used market for a song, basically. And they're still great navigators with a ton of amazing capability. And um, so let's dive in here. And, and the, the comment from the guy at, at the Garmin was uh, the product first came out in 1998, over 23 years ago. He says, technology has come a long way since then. He says, and not many people still have cars 20 plus old, let alone computers and other techs. And here we are. So uh, first, let me start out with a couple of thanks. Uh, uh, at the top of the list is the uh, Ventura County 99s. Uh, Brian and I have both been speaking for the VC 99s for a couple of years now. And uh, they uh, gave us, uh, they're, they're lending us the, uh, the media here that we're using it to uh, get to these seminars, webinars out to you. So thanks very much to them for letting us use that. Uh, the next thing is a resource page. This is on Brian's uh, Captain Schiff's uh, website there. On that page, you will find links to the recordings of the previous episodes. You'll also find some documents. You'll find a link to the Garmin simulator. So uh, this would be a good time to post that. I see you did that already. Good, good job. You're way ahead of me. I'm working on it. Um, so if you go to this page there, we try to keep that up to date pretty much. And Brian, I do have another document for you to put up there in a little bit. You'll get the link in just a couple seconds. Okay. Um, 
So that's a good place to start is here uh, for kind of notes, some tools you can use to keep up with this. Uh, speaking of the Garmin simulator, this is a link to the one that I use. And let's see, Brian, I'll throw that one in the, the, the link uh, in the chat box there. I'm gonna, right. Oh, Steve says he's got a 310R with a GNS 430. That's what I got my multi-engine rating in almost 40 years ago is a Cessna 310R. It's a nice, nice airplane. Uh, so there are a couple of different versions of the Garmin simulator out there. The older versions do not work with Windows 10. Uh, and the newer version that I'm using works with Windows 10, but I can't simulate a non-WASP GPS. I kind of wanted to do that tonight because there's just a slight difference in the approach enunciation on a non-WASP GPS. So I'll just have to talk about it instead. Um, I do have a YouTube channel where the recordings of these are to be found. There's a, the uh, URL. Brian will post the link hopefully here in a moment in the chat. There it is. So if you go to that YouTube channel, you can see all these recordings and a few other things I've got there too. If you subscribe to that channel, then you will get a notification when, the, when new recordings are loaded. So that's also a, a really good resource for you. And if you like the various recordings that you looked, then other people can find it too. Uh, and let's see, finally here, I think this is finally, if you would like to send us some contributions to help offset some of the pretty substantial costs we have to, for the, uh, uh, the Zoom account and some of the other devices and equipment that we're using here. Uh, you can pay by Zelle or Venmo or PayPal. Other people have found me on uh, Pop Money. And uh, even if you'd like to send a check to us, then send me an email uh, by the email that's on that uh, resource page that Brian has, and we'll send you the address for where to send it, an old fashioned check. Um, so, the last session that we did was on holding patterns. And I just wanted to throw this in there because I got an email from a gentleman who kind of planted this seed for how could I do this particular technique in his airplane in the real world. And so I, I talked about this technique just at the end of the last webinar. It's kind of a, I call it a stolen holding pattern where you can use a holding pattern that exists in another procedure and apply it to your route. So I got an email from a, a, a viewer of the program here, Denny Southard sent me this and uh, he was flying out of Gunnison, Colorado in a uh, Bonanza, A36, I believe Bonanza. And this is the one we borrowed. And just a week or so ago, he did this in his airplane using that technique that I showed you in the last one. And he grabbed this screenshot of his foreflight on the way out. So he, he set it all up and he used an autopilot to, uh, to fly this. The, the heading bug out there to the east, and then he went direct to the fix and flew the holding pattern that he stole from an instrument approach and used that to fly a departure procedure instead. So it was a very clever way to do it. Uh, he was using an old KSC 225 autopilot with a Garmin GNS 530 W, and this is what it looked like, and I think it's beautiful. And it, it shows not only a, an advanced, a 400 level skill with the Garmin 5, 530 to make it do this, but also a pretty advanced skill with ForeFlight to be able to lay that chart over the correct chart over the sectional chart and then grab a screenshot of it on the way. So nice job there, Denny. Thanks for sending me that. I, I really appreciated seeing that. It's good to hear you guys are using these techniques out there in a the real world and making it happen. So tonight, our uh, agenda is going to be a, a basics of GPS approaches we're going to talk about how to load and activate approaches or, or getting onto the approach by a couple different means. Um, checking the navigation, it's really important when you're going to do any kind of approach, but especially a GPS approach, that you know how and where and when to validate that the navigator is giving you the correct guidance along the way. So we'll also dive into missed approaches. And then once you've done that missed approach and you're going to go to your alternate or some other airport at the next uh, next flight in your um, in your next airport in your flight, that you know how to do that. And that addresses that first question that I think it was Rob asked, or maybe it was Ron at the beginning. So let's talk just briefly about the basics of GPS approaches. Uh, the first thing is I kind of break these down into there are two kinds of GPS approaches. You're going to have approaches that have vertical guidance and you're going to have approaches that don't have vertical guidance. So among these with vertical guidance, believe it or not, there are two types of vertical guidance you can get. One is approved guidance or you could have advisory guidance. So an approved guidance is going to be something like an LPV or an LNAV VNAV type of approach. Advisory guidance is anything with a plus V on it. We're going to take a look at that in just a second. I'll talk briefly about what that means to you. 
Uh, there are also approaches that use two different types of lateral guidance. Uh, the, the first one that you're probably all familiar with is LNAV approach. This is a fixed width of 0.3 nav uh, nautical miles either side of the center line. That's the accuracy of the guidance as you proceed down final. The other type is an LPV. The Garmin books are actually wrong on this. They call this lateral precision with vertical guidance. It actually stands for localizer performance with vertical guidance. Same letters, and we all know what we're talking about. It's, it's essentially the same thing. So you get an angle with an LPV, and that's the same way that a localizer works. With, it gets more sensitive as you get closer to the airport. And the LNAV, slightly different than a VOR style, because it's, it, it stays a fixed accuracy all the way down final where a VOR approach will change. It might get bigger, might get smaller, depending on where the VOR is in, in relation to the airport. So in total, we have, we end up with six different kinds of minimums that you might see displayed on your navigator that come from these, these three sorts of subdivisions of approaches. So these are what you'll see. You, we got three LNAVs, we got three LPVs, we've got a one that's an L slash with some, or an LPV that has uh, approved guidance, and we have an LP plus V and an LNAV plus V that are advisory guidance. So here's another way to look at it. Uh, if you look at your lateral guidance, you can have fixed or you can have an angle. And across the vertical, you can have no vertical, you can have approved vertical, or you can have advisory vertical. And you end up with minimums that look like this. LNAV or LP come both in the no vertical guidance, so this is a non-precision approach uh, and varying degrees of accuracy. You can have approved guidance is going to be enunciated either with an L slash VNAV, if, it's an, if the basic underlying approach is an LNAV approach, and if the basic underlying approach is one of those with the, the tapering guidance, the angle guidance on final, it'd be an LPV. And with an advisory glide slope, either type of advisory glide slope shows up as a plus V. And the thing is, you won't see that plus V on the approach chart. You're only going to see LNAV or you'll see LP. Oops, I made that say LPV plus V. It actually says LP plus V. So my bad on that typo. I've got to fix that. So regarding those advisory glide paths, these are not approved, they're not charted, they're not uh, surveyed by the FAA, they're not guaranteed to be obstacle free. So there are some issues there, there are some risks involved with them. And uh, it, for that, for a, a good detail on this, let me steer you toward, this is uh, the next link to post in there, Brian, and I'd like to put this one on the resource website too. put a link to this article. Um, my friend Peter King wrote this, uh, and he, it's blogged on his website called Master Flight, article called There Be Dragons. That's just a PDF you can download. So go find that article and read it. He'll do a deep dive on them. Uh, the bottom line is we as pilots need to treat them like they are a non-precision approach with an MDA, a minimum descent altitude, as opposed to a DA like you'd have on an LPV or an L slash VNAV. So uh, one way to do that, and I'll touch on an, an example or two down the road here, uh, is you can take that MDA and add 50 feet to it and come up with what's called a derived decision altitude. And if you bump that up 50 feet, now you can treat that like a decision altitude, get to that altitude, make your decision, can you see enough to land and start your mist immediately? That's a perfectly legit way to do that. And that's because we're not allowed to bust MDAs, right? Correct. You, thou shalt not descend below MDA unless you can comply. You can see at least one of those things in 91.175E. I call it a, the laundry list of things on the runway. So runway edge lights, centerline lights, approach lights, threshold lights, right, so forth. You have to see something to be able to descend below MDA. So you look up at your DDA, your MDA plus 50. If you see something, you can land. If you don't, then go missed. Okay. Um, so these are the approaches I'm going to look at tonight. Um, if we have any time in an extra session, uh, once we're done with the recording, we could play around for a, little, a few more minutes if we want to. Uh, but this is probably going to use up all the time we have just for tonight. And I, I bring these up because I'd like you to have these handy as you are watching tonight. Pull them up on your ForeFlight or, or AirNav or whatever tool you have uh, that you use for approach charts. And I had to be kind of picky. The problem is that database in this Garmin Navigator is so old. It's almost 14 years old now. So I had to find approaches that have changed very little since then so that we could use a chart that kind of matches the database. 
So at this point, I'm going to switch over to my four flight and I'll show you just briefly uh, what these uh, things look like. So switch here, do, do, do. And in just a moment now, you should be able to see my four flight. And we're looking at, oops, that's the second one. Here's the first one we're going to look at tonight. It's a VOR or GPS alpha approach. And um, so the first thing to notice about this is, is the approach title name. This is uh, an overlay style approach. You can do this using a VOR or using a GPS. Either one is okay. Um, there's also such a thing as standalone GPS approaches. Those are going away. And in fact, with the, the approaches that I'm familiar with in the SoCal area here, there are no standalone just GPS approaches anymore. All we have are a few overlays. And then we've gone to the RNAS. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so this is a super simple approach. It's got a final approach fix that doubles as an initial approach fix over paradise with a holding pattern there, a hold in lieu of procedure turn. And it, it's got a, it's a circling approach. It doesn't have a runway number in it. It has a, a, a dash al or alpha at the end. So that means it's a circling approach only. There are no straight in minimums. Uh, I do like the government charts because they show you this, uh, where the, the uh, final approach course comes into the airport. So you can see it's aiming right for the middle of the airport which is part of why it's not a circling approach. Um, and it's got a, a missed approach procedure that takes you right back to the VOR for the next one. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on these procedures. I'm not gonna teach you how to read these charts. We're just gonna dive right into what the next one is. Um, next, I'm gonna take you over to Ontario, California, right next door from a, a Corona there. And uh, we're gonna do this RNAV GPS Yankee runway eight right. So first, this is the new naming convention. It's an RNAV GPS, which means it's an area navigation type approach that uses GPS as its fundamental navigation. There are others that use RNP or DME. Um, there might even be a couple other types. Uh, the Yankee is a bit weird. That just means that there are, are more than one approach to this runway using the same nav aid to both to runway eight right um, and Typically, when you, you're in this situation, there's two different RNAV approaches to the same piece of concrete. And this also happens with ILSs and, and some other types. Um, normally, they'll start at the end of the alphabet, and the Z will have the lowest approach minimums. And the next higher minimums are going to be the Yankee, and then the Whiskey, and the X-Ray, and so forth. So there is probably an RNAV Zulu approach to this runway, but we're not going to concern ourselves with that. Uh, I chose this one because, first of all, it's in the Garmin database and it's still fairly current. We've got a couple different initial approach fixes out here. Uh, we've got a feeder fix from Paradise that takes you to Seiko as an IAF. And then you do this hold in lieu of procedure turn and you proceed inbound. We've got our final approach fixes over here. And then we've got our uh, runway, the airport, and missed approach. It takes you out to some fix down at the end here uh, to uh, IBACs for your hold. Um, down here at the minimums, you can see that we've got several different types of minimums. We've got LPV, we've got LNAV, VNAV, and we've got LNAV as far as the straight in approaches. So if you were set up so that you could see LNAV plus V, you can see there's no chart for that. It, it's just not here. So what are the minimums? You're going to use the LNAV minimums, and that's an MDA. It's not a DA. So these approved vertical guidance with the LPV and the LNAV slash VNAV, these are both decision altitudes. So you can follow this electronic glide slope all the way toward the runway. When you get to the decision altitude, this 1220 in the case of LPV, uh, when you get to that altitude, then you're going to look at the runway. And do you see one of those things out of that laundry list that I mentioned in 91175E? And if you see one or more of those things, then you can continue. If not, you have to go miss. Uh, it's really, other than that, a fairly straightforward approach. There's really no surprises on that one. So next, we're going to take you over to my home airport to Fullerton. Here we have an RNAV GPS runway 24. This is the new naming convention. It starts up here at Pomona as the IAF. That's the only IAF on this approach. We come down here to Lamy and then uh, Haver and Actec and on the way in. This one you'll see down here, it has, again, only LNAV minimums. That's an MDA of 900 feet for category A. Nine, you need a mile and a quarter visibility for category B. If you're going faster than 120 knots, 
you're in category C or D and, and this approach is not authorized. So don't forget, if you like to fly fast on final, uh, and if you're in actual IMC conditions, then you need to slow down below 120 knots or less. So uh, this is a fairly simple approach, but it does have a couple little gotchas I'm going to show you. Uh, for instance, why we don't use vectors to final, why we prefer to use a, another method of getting onto the approach. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then finally, I'm going to take you over to uh, Chino. And oops, I pulled up the wrong plate here. Standby one, Chino procedure. We're going to do the ILS or localizer to runway 26 right. And for this approach, now this is a terrestrial Navate approach, the ILS that we've all come to know and love, but we're going to fly much of it using the GPS to navigate it. Um, on, you cannot use the GPS to navigate the final approach course. So once we cross Linden, I'm sorry, Dewey intersection, which is the final approach fix with the Maltese cross there, that portion of the approach, we have to use the localizer to, to fly that approach. We cannot use the GPS. But the good news is we can use the GPS to navigate everything else. So if we use Paradise as our, our feeder fix, we come over here to CASB, we do this holding pattern, uh, one or more turns in it, we proceed inbound. We can do all that using the GPS and that makes it really simple. So uh, those are the approaches we're gonna use for tonight. Uh, and let me see, what did I have to do? do. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this just real quick here, because I see this with a lot of pilots I fly on instrument approaches. I do a lot of IPCs. And you come up to the final approach fix and nothing happens. You just keep motoring past it. and You don't even acknowledge really that you've got there. So I want you to think as you cross the final approach fix or, or less than a mile or so before it, here's a mnemonic that I learned. When I learned this checklist, when I was an instrument student back when the that Earth's crust was still cooling. I had five T's in it. I've kind of expanded a little bit. So the first thing is time. Hack your time if you're on a timed approach. Uh, turn to the final approach course heading. Twist the uh, CDI or the OBS to be the final approach course uh, guidance, that course line. Throttle, once you're established on the course, reduce your throttle and join the, the uh, vertical guidance if there is any or set up your descent rate, but don't, start down until you're established on the approach. People have busted IFR check rides for that or, or they've even gotten in trouble, uh, and maybe even bent some metal by descending early when you're not established. That's not a good idea. Uh, next, tires. So make sure your, your wheels are down and green. And I actually expand this out to the whole before landing checklist. So anything you've got on your aircraft's before landing checklist should be complete by this point. Uh, at least approach flaps, if not full flaps. I prefer to shoot my approaches, generally speaking, with approach flaps, flaps 10 in my 182. Uh, the next one is talk, so call the tower or report on the CTAF, your final approach fix inbound. And this last one is my most recent addition, think. And what I want you to do is to think about what you're doing on this approach. What kind of approach navigation am I using? Where is it going to be? What should it look like? How will I know if I'm, uh, if I'm not, oh, you know, I didn't save this, the proper screen here, did I? Uh, and go back to this. I had a lot of this on, on great slides here. Let me go back to these slides real briefly. Um, okay, so those are pro approaches. Here's my final approach fix checklist, time turn, twist, throttle, tires, talk, think. And that's what we're talking about right now is think about this. Where's your approach navigation? What's it look like? Do you have the correct source selected? Is, is it in VLOC if you're doing a VOR approach or an ILS approach? Is it in GPS if you're executing some form of RNAV approach? Uh, the mode enunciated, do you see the type of approach mode navigation that you were expecting to see? In other words, are you seeing LPV or LNAV or LNAV plus V? And I'm gonna show you how to predict what you're gonna get and what it's gonna look like. We'll, we'll look at that in just a minute. And then I want you to think about your final approach fix crossing altitude. Are you on glide slope and are, do you see on your altimeter the number that the chart says you should see? And if not, is it legit? Are you a dot low and so your altimeter is a little bit low or are you right on course as you cross it and maybe you've got the wrong altimeter setting? Uh, maybe you're on an ILS approach and you've captured one of those false glide slopes and you're at the incorrect altitude. So just make sure you've got the correct altitude across this. And then keep in mind your decision altitude for the, the bottom end of this approach. Know what that number is. 
Uh, some of these approach charts we looked at, you might have noticed at the top, there, there's a little red uh, NOTAMS tag. It's a four-flight feature, and a lot of other apps have this. There could be a NOTAM that changes your decision altitude or MDA. So make sure you know what the correct MDA is going to be for this approach uh, and have that in mind as you go down. Now, some of my students call me the master of distraction, and one of my favorite distractions is we go halfway down final, and I say, okay, what's your decision altitude? Uh, I forgot. Now they get, they're back down in the chart trying to find it and remember if there was a correction they needed to make to it. So good idea to review that before you get to the, the final approach fix. And Mike, can you go back one slide? We've got several requests to see that again. Yep. Yeah. Time turn twist, rattle tires talk, think. Now I've heard a lot of different varieties of this, a, a couple different mnemonics over the years, and there's no wrong one. This is one that I use. That I think it covers all the bases. Okay, uh, yeah, Bill Chambers, yes, you can look these up in SkyVector, airnav.com is another good place to look for these. Um, okay, so armed with all this, and we're going to think about this, let's see, did I get everything in there? Um, yeah, uh, the, the first steps in the MIST, so it, almost always the first step of the MIST approach procedure is a climb. Not always, there's a, a few small exceptions, or, you know, if you're a long way out, if you're going into LAX or uh, Washington National, uh, Brian and I both train on these, the missed approach altitude is 2,000 feet. So if you determine before that that you're going to go missed, you might have to continue your descent down to the, the uh, missed approach altitude. And some airports like Van Nuys have crossed below a certain altitude because of a crossing approach above it. Yeah, oh, that would have been a good one to pull up. But you know that, that's beyond the, the uh, scope of this particular meeting. We, we could probably each, um, we could even do a tag team one on interesting approaches and some things, some gotchas on some of these procedures to point out. That'd be fun. So, we should do that. Yeah, good idea. Put that one in the hopper. Put a pin in it, as they say. All right, so now we're going to uh, get out of this. Do we have any questions that I can handle while I'm doing this swap over here? Um, yeah, there, on some approaches with a hold for the entry, the 430W asks if you want to do the turn. On others, you have to go to flight plan and delete it. Why? Um, I'll take a look at that, actually. One of the ones I'm going to show you here is, is kind of interesting in that regard. Um, and I'm just I'm having a hard time getting to the, the right screen share I want to do. Um, one of the ones I'm going to look at is going to have an example. I can show you why sometimes it offers you to do the cold course reversal and sometimes it doesn't. So I will cover that one. Uh, is it possible to enlarge? Uh, this gets as, as bad, as big as it gets. Make your screen I think that was, that was up when we were looking at approach plates. Oh, okay. Um, do, do any of the 430, 530s automatically switch from GPS to VLOC mode inside the initial approach fix? There is a setting in, in one of the settings back here. Let me see if I can find it. Um, in the auxes, it, I think on some of these, um, CDI alarms. If we go into here, selected CDI auto. So uh, you can... Uh, Two of these settings here will let you change this. Um, let me move to the right spot here. ILS CDI capture. Uh, I believe that's what these have to do. Personally, I prefer to manually be responsible to change to uh, VLOC if I'm doing a, an ILS or a VOR. I always like to know, I, would, I, I like to be in control of where my navigation is coming from. I see that's been a killer switch where a lot of people will forget to switch that on approaches. Absolutely I've, I've true. That yes. Will the 430 have that auto feature as well, or is that just on the 530? I believe it's both. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, perhaps not with an older version of the software installed, though. So if you're operating a really old version of the software, it might be different. Uh, so um, this is it's probably on this page, though. So go find this page in your settings, and that'll get you at least into the ballpark of the right thing. So it is, as far as I know, it is user adjustable. Oops, yeah, here I'm sitting in a holding pattern. That's interesting. <laughs> okay, uh, when, are, when alternate missed approach instructions from ATC are authorized, uh, if they tell you, typically, sometimes an approach plate will have two different sets of minimums, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, two different missed approach procedures. There's a standard and then there's an alternate, and they will tell you if they want you to do the alternate missed approach. Um, 
What is it useful given that 430 is not going to support it? It works great. Uh, Jay, uh, the, the uh, these things are old, but they work great. There's still thousands of them out in the, the market. And so they'll be around for a long time, I think. Uh, what do you do if the glide slope shows on just before the final approach fix is reached? Uh, that I will talk about that in just a little bit. That's part of the pre prepping for the approach and verifying that you're in the, the proper mode. Uh, and uh, Charlton's question on when does the glide path activate? I will get to that. And um, uh, Brian's asking about glide path capturing uh, and why why it captures. Sometimes it doesn't. We'll talk about that. Okay, so. Let's dive in on my on these, and I'm going to load up the first approach we're going to do. Let me get this plate in front of me so that I can prep for the correct thing. Uh, we're going to do the uh, Corona Airport, the KHAO, VOR, or GPS Alpha. So we're flying along. We happen to be in a holding pattern here over, um, over Paradise VOR. Uh, it's kind of a funky pattern here, and I'm zoomed way out here. So let me zoom in a little bit. We can see some more, more text. So um, normally you'd have a flight plan loaded and you, you would add your approach to the end of the flight plan. And um, there's a couple of different ways to do this. What I like to do is I, I build my flight plan. I talked about this in one of the previous episodes from my departure airport to my destination. And then when you put, push the procedure button and load the approach, it puts that approach at the end of the flight plan. So your flight plan goes from your last fix to the airport and then back to the initial approach fix that begins the approach. And what I do is I just go in and I delete the airport so that I go from my last filed waypoint to the IAF that begins the approach and then down the approach. So that's one way to handle it. Another way is um, just don't put the destination airport in there. I don't like that one because the navigation mode, if you see uh, here in the lower left corner, it says term. That means I'm in the terminal mode and it switches to the terminal mode when you're less than 30 miles, roughly 30 miles from your destination. So if you don't have a destination in there, you may not be in terminal mode. You may not have the required accuracy for your navigation for that point in time. So we're flying along here and uh, we're gonna add a procedure. So you push the procedure button. And we don't want to activate this approach. We want to select another approach. Uh, and actually, let me do this a slightly different way. I'm going to go to the flight plan. I'm going to delete the whole flight plan. Well, oh, and you go to the menu rather. And we're going to come down here to delete flight plan. So delete all waypoints in the flight plan. Yes, we're going to do that. So now our flight plan is empty. And now I'm going to go to procedure and it starts out with select approach. So we select our approach and it, it loads with either the destination airport that's in your flight plan or whatever the last one was that you happen to load. So uh, we're not going to do Ontario for this one. Oops, I did it again. We load the procedure. We're going to just spin the little knob and we're going to start typing in the airport and we're going to type in KAJO. A little bit tedious. Uh, this is where the the uh, the ability to load that flight plan in your iPad in in say uh, ForeFlight, for example, and send it to your your navigator, and then it knows where you're going, so you don't have to type this in. So the first thing is you select the airport, um, and now normally it will it'll take you to the approach box. In this case, in the case of Corona, there is only one approach for this airport. So that's why it skipped the approach. It said, okay, if you're gonna do an approach to Corona, there's only one option. So I don't need to ask you which approach. So normally though, if you go to this box and you spin a little knob, it brings up this menu where you can select the approach that you wanna do. In this case, it took us directly to the select the transition menu. So I'm going to talk briefly about this vectors to final versus the, the Paradise IAF. And I'm a big fan of selecting the IAF or NIAF initial approach fix. It sets you up on the approach. I'm not a big fan of using vectors to final. And I'll, we'll come back to this for a little bit. But when you select vectors to final, it only shows you a very small part of the approach. And it really doesn't show you enough, I don't think. So I'm going to select this approach. 
Now the question is activate or load frequently. If you have other flight plan fixes in there, it will ask you whether you wanna load the approach or activate the approach. And here's a key I want you to remember is when you activate the approach, whether you do it here or you do it on the flight plan page or some other way, when you activate the approach, the navigator stops doing what it's doing and it takes you direct from your present position to that IAF. So before you activate this, you have to ask yourself, is that what I wanna do? Do I wanna stop doing what I'm doing and go to the IAF? One question of course is, is the IAF behind me? If you've already passed it, you're somewhere else down the approach and then you can really steer yourself in the wrong direction if you activate this approach. The truth of the matter is, you, there are almost no circumstances in which you have to activate the approach. So in this case, because we don't have a flight plan in there, it's going to ask us, do we wanna activate that approach? So I'm gonna say yes. And when you activate the approach, even when you load the approach, it takes you back over to the active flight plan. So it gives you an opportunity to look at this. And if you refer now to your paper diagram of this approach that I asked you to pull up just a moment ago, we're gonna look at the top here. It says the, it's a, the approach is the VOR alpha. We're gonna do the uh, paradise as an initial approach fix. Here's the course and here's the distance. We're gonna hold, and that's also the final approach fix. And here's your inbound course and one minute legs. The next fix is runway 25, which is um, basically over the beginning of the airport here. Um, this is kind of an odd depiction for, I almost was making me think if I got the right airport in here, but we're gonna go to 3.6 miles on a 235 course. And you can see on the paper diagram, it's showing 237. I'll come back to that in just a moment. That's the missed approach point, that MA, that little magenta MA says that that is your missed approach point. So that's a good thing to know. Uh, and then the next fix is the Paradise VOR. That's the missed approach hold point, MH. And to get to that hold point, it's a 055 course for 3.6 miles. And then we're going to hold there on the 258 radio for one minute legs. So it's it, this is another opportunity just to compare what the navigator has to what the approach chart says. And this is part of the process if you're using an older database, uh, if your navigator allows it, if your airplane flight manual supplement allows it, this is the place you go to to verify that everything is correct. We got a flashing message light. I always like to look at that message light. It says to set the course to 245. So we'll take our course pointer here. We'll spin it around to 245. We'll get rid of that one. And do not use for navigation. No, this, this is just a toy we're playing with right now. So we're on this flight plan page. Press the flight plan button. It takes you back to the nav page. We're on nav page one. And I want to take a look at nav page two and we can zoom in a little bit here. So we're out here just by Riverside Airport. Uh, let's go ahead and pick up the speed a little bit. And our autopilot is in nav mode. And this holding pattern is at 3,100 feet. So I'll descend to 3,100 feet. So you can see our autopilot in this nav mode is flying us over there directly to paradise. So our active waypoint is paradise as an IA. That's an initial approach fix. So in other words, when we get to paradise, the navigator is going to treat this as an initial approach and not immediately sequence onto the approach and go do the, the final approach because we haven't done the hold in lieu of procedure turn. We haven't aligned ourselves with the, the correct inbound course. So this is, uh, let's see, we don't have time on that leg. On page, on that page one, we got the time is three and a half minutes. I'll pick up the pace a little bit here. We're getting our fire breathing a 200 knot airplane to get on this approach. So notice over here in the lower left corner, this uh, GPS mode enunciation says term. That means we're in the terminal mode of navigation. That means we're within about 30 miles, give or take, of the destination. And this CDI scale is one mile from the center to the edge uh, is one mile. So if our deviation indicator is over here at one dot off, that means we're half a mile off course, off track. So always check this. If you're ready to go inbound, that should show something different. We're going to look at that in just a minute. This gives our time to the, to the our distance from the station and our time to it. So I kind of keep an eye on that as I'm approaching it. It says I've got 30 seconds, give or take, uh, until I get to that fix, and then things will start happening. Um, this leg is a, a one minute approach. Uh, notice now we're enunciating. We're going to do a direct entry to this holding pattern. The GPS calculates all this and it knows where we're coming from. That's going to work. 
It's going to do a right turn to 080 in six seconds, and it will enter the hold. And when we enter the hold, then this is the time. If you're going to do this hold, and especially if you're under IFR, this is one of the required reports. Tell ATC that you're entering the hold, and they want the time that you enter the hold. So we're entering the hold over Paradise at time 0040. He doesn't care about the seconds. He just wants hours and minutes. Okay. So we're going to fly this hold, and you'll see it does this beautifully. It does it in the airplane if you've got GPSS. It will navigate this. Uh, typically in the aircraft with GPSS, you're ha you'll have your heading, your autopilot mode is set to heading. And uh, the, the GPSS system will give heading instructions to the GPS, to, to, to the autopilot rather, to fly the approach. And while you're doing that, Mike, there was a question about someone who, when they're in GPSS, they're told not to do the hold and just continue in uh, and not do the hold. So once, okay. how do you keep it from entering the hold when you're approaching that final fix and, and continue straight in? That's a good time to talk about that. Uh, in this particular method, the way to do that, and actually, let me slow down a little bit here. The way to do that on this particular type of approach where the, <clears throat> the hold in lieu of procedure turn is at the final approach fix, so that can be a little bit problematic. Uh, what I do is I just come to the, the flight plan here. Um, let's see, uh, you give yourself a cursor and scroll down to the hold and then you can push the clear button and it says remove holding pattern, yes or no. So if you do that, that'll delete the holding pattern. Now I don't wanna do that at the moment. So I'm gonna leave it here and, and we can take a look at that in a minute. Hopefully that answers that one. Uh, kind of a similar thing in a few other cases that we'll look at in a, a couple of minutes as we go along. Um, so the, this holding pattern is a minute. It's going to be a minute no matter how we do this. But let's say we're outbound and air traffic control says, okay, you don't need to do the hold. You can proceed direct paradise cleared for the approach. How do we do that? Again, let's just come to the uh, flight plan here. Actually, you can just push, press the uh, direct button because that's our active waypoint. It's going to say, do you want to go direct to your active waypoint again from here? Yeah, we want to do that. So we'll activate directly to Paradise. It goes direct there. Now, uh, it still thinks it's an initial approach fix. It still thinks you want to do that hold. So we're going to have to scroll down here and get rid of the hold uh, this time for sure. So we remove that. Oop, it's not going to want to do that. But we might have to finesse this a little bit. What if we scroll down to the paradise on the second paradise and hit direct? Well, Does that's that the missed approach hold. So this is um, not going to sequence you onto the approach. Oh, it's after the runway. This is a case where the, the fix does double duty as, as a, the initial approach fix and the missed approach hold point. That's a trap so, that I would fall for. Yeah, let's do this one instead. We can uh, highlight that hold and press menu and activate that leg. Holding pattern, we want to activate that. Let's see what it's going to do here. Oh, it's going to do the hold again. So this is an interesting case where it's it really wants to do one turn in that holding pattern. Uh, so let me try one other thing here. If we go to flight plan and we activate that hold, that's what we did, isn't it? Activate leg, activate... Okay, so yeah, it's just going to do that hold. So it's going to make us do the hold one time in this. I didn't delete the hold. Yeah, I tried. It wouldn't let me. <laughs> uh, I, it wasn't due to already being in the hold. We'll see another example here in a minute if we get around to it. Uh, activate leg hold to runway. Yeah, this is a, a way to do it here. Let me just slow down a little bit. Let's see what happens if we activate that leg, the hold to the runway. This is kind of cheating and I'm not a big fan of this because we're activating the final approach course and that's usually not a safe way to do this, but you can see it did work. So you don't want to be wandering around out here. Uh, notice also that we're beyond one mile from the course, but here's our final approach course goes to the runway now. We're flying from Paradise as the final to the runway as the missed approach point. So it's legit, it's kind of working, but boy, if you're anywhere close to the final approach fix, especially if you're past the final approach fix, this is a really dangerous maneuver to do. We're in not that regard, established. It, it looks like it turned the wrong way. I would have preferred to keep turning around in the hole, but it went the shortest distance, right? Yes. And if I had waited until it had done, done more of the turn, 
it probably would be safer, but we're still not established on this course. So we can't descend yet. We still have to be at 3,100 feet, even though our, our MDA is 16, 1,700 feet, call it. So notice this countdown now, we're, it's 0.6 miles over there. And in this approach mode, in LNAV mode, it's 0.3. So you're gonna see this countdown to 0 0.3. And when it gets to 0 0.3, now we're gonna get our deviation indicator here. We'll see our course indicator on the HSI is going to start coming in and the autopilot is going to start turning to intercept this. Uh, message lights flashing because it wants us to have our desired track at 235. Uh, invalid flight plan modification. So the, the navigator really didn't like that, and I don't either. So now we're within 0.3 miles of the course and the deviation indicator is coming in. Now we're established. Now we could start down. But that, that's, yeah, <laughs> Timothy Blake and I says, hey, time to go miss. Yep, exactly. So let's uh, leave this in this mode. We, we're, let's take a look at what happens as we get to the missed approach point. We got about three quarters of a mile to get there. Our MDA is 1660, I'll call it 1700 feet. Uh, so we're gonna get down here and uh, Steve's asking about what about suspend to get out of the hold? Yes, sometimes, but if you were quick to look there, um, you'll notice that we weren't in suspend mode it was going to sequence the waypoint anyway. So let's watch what happens at the missed approach point. And I'm gonna stop it right there. So we hit the fix, we go paradise to runway right now. As soon as we hit that fix, that fix stays there and we stay in LNAV mode. Let me stop the autopilot here for a moment. Over on the left-hand side, you see this little green carrot over here. And we see over the OBS button, we see that suspend is enunciated. That means that waypoint sequencing has suspended. It's not going to advance through the missed approach procedure. And it's not going to sequence any more waypoints. This is the runway is the active waypoint as the missed approach point. And the reason it's doing that, I, I, it's hard for me to get in the heads of the Garmin engineers who designed this, but my thinking of, on this is that this little carrot over on the left, that's your bearing pointer. It's pointing in the shortest direction of turn to the missed approach point. So if you consider this is a circling approach. So if you're going to circle to the runway after doing this approach and you're doing, the, you're doing this circling maneuver and you have to go missed, you have to start the missed approach procedure from the missed approach point. So it's showing you the quickest way to get there. That, I think that's why that works. And yes, Joe mentions that carrot is only on the 530. Yes, it's not on the 430. So if you can afford the real estate for a 530, this is one of the really big things. And the, yes, the mist says to turn right. And that's the difference between a circling procedure and a mist procedure. We have not begun the mist approach procedure yet. We're still in the circle procedure. So let's, uh, let's take a look what's going on. The autopilot is going to continue to fly straight. Um, it's not going to follow that needle over there. And a, let's say we start our missed approach and we want to start climbing. It's the first part of this procedure up to 3,000 feet. If we want it to start navigating the missed approach procedure, you just have to press this OBS button, the, the button that's underneath where it says suspend. You press that, it comes out of suspend. The navigation mode in that lower left corner changed from LNAV to term. It went back to green on black instead of black on green. Now our navigation mode, you can see over the CDI pointer here, it says direct to paradise. And that's what the missed approach procedure says to do. So it's gonna take us back to paradise and do the whole. Uh, only shown on the arc view. Now we can look at this also on the, the carrot is only shown on the arc view, yes. You don't get the carrot on the plan view because because uh, I don't know, it's kind of a confusing display already. There's a lot of stuff on here, especially if you're, if you're um, not decluttered at all. So we pressed the OBS button, we got out of suspend mode, now we're navigating the missed approach procedure and it's taking us back to paradise and all life is a sunny day. Okay, so that is what I wanted to show you on this particular approach. Let's put it back into heading mode here and I'm going to point us over in the other direction and we're going to start doing the next approach. So if you would all change in your hymnals over to uh, the Ontario Airport, take a look at the RNAV GPS Yankee approach to runway eight right. And I had to choose this one carefully because a lot of the approaches in Ontario have changed, but this one is still the same in the uh, Navigator database, so we can do that. 
So a couple of things are going on. We're in this holding pattern. Uh, we've decided we don't want to land at Corona anymore. You can see Ontario here just in the top of the screen as we turn past it. So it's pretty close. Um, so the first question is, how do you load a second approach? And uh, this question has also come up in a couple of the earlier programs. And it's one of the major limitations of the Garmin 430, 530 is you can only have one airport. You can only have one destination, or I'm sorry, one approach in the flight plan at a time. So when you look in the flight plan, that approach is still in there for Corona, but we don't wanna do that one anymore. So we wanna to go to Ontario. Let's take a look at how to do this. And you might also use this technique if you're flying um, an IPC. You have to do several different kinds of approaches to do an instrument proficiency check. Many of them are at different airports. So let's take a look. We're gonna start with, here's the way I do it. There's a lot of different ways to do it. You can start in a flight plan and delete the flight plan, add the new destination, go to the procedure page, select. For my money, it's just a little bit easier to start on the procedure page. And if there is an approach loaded, it always gives you these top two options, activate vectors to final or activate approach. We don't wanna do that. We wanna select a different approach. But wait, you say, you wanna select an approach at a different run airport. Yes, we do. And now let's look at how to do that. So you highlight select approach. We're going to click enter. Uh, and it's all, it assumes we want to go back to the same airport. It assumes we want to go back to the same approach. And it assumes we want to start with the same transition we loaded last time. But that's not what we want. So we're going to get rid of that cursor. It's going to take us back to the approach selector. Take that big knob and spin it over to the left, over to the airport column. And we can type in our new uh, approach in here. Oops. Okay, now we're gonna to go to Ontario. So we type in Ontario, T-O-N-T. And you're gonna to have to type that airport name in there somewhere. It depends whether you're gonna type it on the flight plan page or on the, uh, the procedure select page. I just think it's a little bit easier to start on the procedure select page. So we're gonna to wanna to go to Ontario. We push enter and enter that one. Now there's a lot of approaches at Ontario. So it's gonna take us to the approach selector menu. And we can see we've got the ILS approaches, we've got uh, RNAV, we've got VOR DME. I think that's a really old one. I don't think that approach even exists anymore. Um, and let's highlight this RNAV 08 right. And you see on the right-hand end of that, that little tiny GPS that shows there. That means that you could use GPS to navigate this approach. Uh, you'll also see that you probably, if you're sharp, you saw that when we selected the approach into Corona, it said VOR or, G or GPS, and it had a little GPS in the name. If that's there, you can use it. Obviously, you can't use GPS for an ILS, so it doesn't show you. So we're going to select this RNAV 8 right, and now it takes us to the transition selector. In this case, we've got a lot of different transitions that we could do. We've got vectors to final. We always have that. Or we've got all these fixes, Amtra, Lahab, Seiko, and Paradise. Notice that Amtra, Lahab, and Seiko all have that IA so those are all initial approach fixes, and Paradise does not. That's not an initial approach. That is a transition leg, a feeder leg. So uh, it's just slightly different. The, when I finally looked it up. The difference is that a feeder segment uses the same obstacle clearance criteria as an en route leg, so a Victor Airway uses. You go, as soon as you get past an IAF, the IAF uses approach uh, obstacle navigation. So, uh, in this case, I want to highlight, for now, let's highlight the Seiko transition as the IAF. Um, if I pick it as the IAF, that includes the hold in lieu of procedure turn. And I want to demonstrate one of the, I saw a couple of questions on this in the uh, intro. So we'll select Seiko. Now it takes us to this page. Let me stop the simulator here while we're at it. What I want to show here is we've got this approach that's loaded in here and you can, okay, look at, we're looking at Ontario and it's the RNAV8, right? It's a Seiko transition. The thick lines in this plan view are the legs that are part of the approach. The thin ones are various transitions. So uh, just check that these names are right. Seiko and Dempy and runway 08, right? And then uh, this one has a fix there called Hoiku. It's not on the current chart, but it's, it's close enough. It, it'll get us where we wanna go. One I want, thing I want to point out here is in that lower, lower right corner, you see where it says LPV? That means the navigator is predicting at this moment it's going to be able to do uh, LPV as your um, approach type, um, your minimums type. 
I'm going to put the autopilot back on and spin it back around to the east a little bit here. I, I think this little angle dangling to the southwest from Seiko, that's present position direct to Seiko. And I want to show you something. You notice now it did not act, ask us whether we wanted to do the, um, the course reversal. So I'm going to pick up the speed here a little bit. I'm going to get down a little bit out to the east. So in this case, because it doesn't offer us the opportunity to load, it's the only thing in the flight plan, all we can do is activate. So let's activate that. And now you can see it takes us back to the flight plan page. We're going to go directly to Seiko, treat it as an initial approach fix. We're going to do the hold uh, and over Seiko. And then we're going to go to Dempy as the final approach fix, uh, runway zero, right, missed approach point, and so forth. Look at the map here. We're heading back toward Chino. Um, and the Ontario airport is over here. So we're going the wrong direction here. And I did this for a reason. I want to turn this. Let me slow it back down to this speed. And we're going to turn back over kind of in the right direction. I'm going to go back to the procedure selector and select this procedure again. I already have eight right Seiko transition. And let me wait till I get turned a little bit more. And I don't know this to be precise, but I believe this is the case. So we've got this waypoint, this uh, Seiko is our final approach, or sorry, our initial approach fix. It's got that holding pattern. If you draw a line perpendicular to it, so the approach course is over here, the airport is, is over in this direction, and we're over in this area. So we're going to get to that fix and we have to turn around. That's when it says, okay, do you want to do that course reversal or not? And what I, when I was playing with it earlier, if I was over on this side, so it's going to be less than a, a right angle turn onto the approach, and I selected Seiko, it did not offer me if I wanted to do that turn. So it's Seiko, we activate, oh, still didn't do it. So I could be wrong. We'll have to keep playing with it. So we're going to go directly to Seiko. We checked those fixes. They're good. Uh, the desired track is 295. I'm going to set my course to 295. We'll set the heading bug to marry up with it. Uh, we're going the right direction now. I'll speed up and take a little bit less time. Yeah. While we're doing this, Brian, we have any other questions we can take a look at? Yeah, a couple of people were asking when uh, going to another airport, why not just go direct to Ontario and then select approach or use the direct or even use the nearest airport so you don't have to do all the dialing in? Is that Will that work just as well? Yeah, the nearest airport is a trick that I've used. If I know that the airport I'm going to is fairly close, I could just activate it, go direct to it, and now it's in my flight plan. Now I can push the procedure button and go there. Um, if you push the direct button and type in the airport, you're stuck with, once again, typing in the airport there. And the fact of the matter is you're probably not going to go directly to the airport. Let's say you're getting vectors onto the approach there. You're going to get vectored toward the, the final approach fix or more likely a couple of miles outside the final approach fix. There, there's a gate there two miles prior that they have to vector you outside of that. So you're not going to go to the airport. So... Outside of using the nearest page, nearest airports to select the airport and going direct that way, you're going to type that airport name in somehow at some point. Okay. And then uh, if you're in GPSS, will the aircraft climb? Will it, it says, will it climb is what Mark was asking. <laughs> <laughs> no, the GPSS is lateral only. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't do the vertical. So your autopilot might, but if it, even if it does, you're going to have to tell it. Do you want to use a flight level change type climb or a vertical speed type climb, whatever climb you want to do? Uh, the navigator is only doing the horizontal, not the vertical. Right. Uh, Walter asked about sending the flight plan to the 430 from your iPad and FlyQ. Uh, I think so. I'm not experienced with FlyQ. I, I have it for a little while. Uh, but what I have found, I use for flight or sometimes I've done it with, um, with flight plan go, the approach does not make the transfer. You can't transfer the approach into the, the 530. Uh, yeah. Somebody points out it should be 3,300. Yeah. That's a good idea. Um, so with flight queue, I'm not sure. Um, can you send from Garmin to, from the 430 to the iPad? Even with four flight? Yes, you can do that. And I think that when you do that, it's, I, I don't know that it sends the, in my airplane when I've done that, I, I put, I load the approach and act, activate it or get it active in my 530. I end up with a series of waypoints on my four flight. I don't end up with the approach as such in there, but it's effectively the same thing. Got it. Okay, so we're heading back toward the fix here. It's going to do that procedure turn and we can make a guess here. I, we're flying at it at 230 knots. We're 
couple of minutes away. It's going to do a parallel entry on this, and here it is. It's telling us it's going to do the parallel entry. Uh, uh, Evan says that a flight stream 210, you can. That's what I've got. You can transfer these things back and forth, but I find that they don't transfer as approaches. They, they transfer as a series of waypoints. And that's different. You won't get the approach mode navigation. And Derek is saying ATC here, we cannot vector any closer than three miles from the final approach fix on a GPS r oh. approach. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, thanks very much for that, Derek. I really appreciate that. It's good to have some ATC folks in here to keep me honest. Um, and, and you can, that's what they're allowed to do. If you are the PI, PIC and you're comfortable with it, you're set up for it, you can ask them to give you a vector directly to the final approach fix, but you have to ask for it. It's like a contact approach or a, you know, some of these other things, uh, a special VFR, you have to ask for it. They can't volunteer it. Okay, now we're inside this pattern here. I'm gonna slow it down to take it out of ludicrous speed. All right, so um, remember when we loaded that approach, we saw in that lower right corner of the screen that it was gonna give us LPV minimums. And what I wanna show you here is I'm gonna pull a dirty trick and I'm gonna turn off our SBAS, our satellite-based augmentation system. Uh, so that we thought that we were going to get um, LPV navigation, uh, but I'm going to fool it here and tell it we don't have it. So watch this now. We select that. Uh, we've changed it. Oops, I've got to come back out of this menu. We go back over to the nav mode here. Um, and I don't really want to fly this whole procedure here, so I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put this thing in heading mode. I'm going to start my turn early. I'm going to re-intercept the inbound course on this thing. Uh, desired track is 076. So basically, I'm turning early. ATC is, is telling me, okay, you don't need to do that holding pattern. We're going to proceed inbound. So watch this. I'm going to give myself an intercept, a turn that will intercept that inbound course. I'm going to pull up the flight plan. I think we're going to have the same mess here. If I activate this leg, let's see what we get. Holding pattern activate. Works better in some cases and, than others. Uh, find different ways to do this and just do what it works. Yeah, leave in heading, it'll be fine probably. So flight simula simulator you recommend. At the Redbirds are real good. Uh, <laughs> short of a Redbird, I use a lot of Microsoft uh, FSX. I do have X-Plane on this computer. I need to upgrade the video card. I upgraded the computer a few years ago, but the, uh, the video card is still old and it just barely will run it. So I've got a little work to do yet. Okay, so our heading bug, I'm gonna turn the heading about over here. I'm gonna turn it outside of the bearing pointer to the fix. Uh, so here's another trick you can do with this for is instead of activating the approach, we can just select a different approach and we can select, I mean, you yeah, know, speed's reasonable. Let's pick the Lahab transition. We can get rid of the holding pattern. So we can activate that Oop. in the heading mode. Now remember, it's gonna activate and go where we were right back to the, the fix we didn't wanna do. So that's not what I wanna do. Uh, let me stop this here, cause I screwed that up. I'm gonna go to procedure. We can select approach. What happened there? Okay, procedure. Select approach, that, that approach, this transition. I'm, let me pick the Amtra transition. We'll just intercept that one instead. We'll fake it. Select the Amtrak. I'm not gonna activate it. I do wanna load it. it. It actually won't let me load it now because it's it's the only one in there. But I'm gonna come to the flight plan page and I can activate the leg into Seiko. So I highlight Seiko, press menu. It says activate leg. Yeah, I wanna do that. So we'll activate that leg and we'll fly from Amtra to Seiko. Now we got our pink line. Now we can start flying. Put it back in nav mode. It'll intercept that and away we go. So this one's a little bit dicey because Amtra is not perfectly lined up. It's another segment into the, uh, into the fix, um, but it's part of the procedure. It's, it's gonna work okay. Can you clear direct two after activating the approach? Well, you can either go direct two or you activate the approach. Those are two different things. Um, and I'll talk about that a, a little bit more in just a second here. We're already already at an hour. It happened again, Brian. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens when you're having fun. Yeah, well, and, and there's a lot of material to cover here. 
So why not use OBS to intercept? That's a good question. And now keep in mind here, Seiko is an intermediate fix. It's not the final approach fix. And the problem is if you, let's say you wanted to go direct to the final approach fix. When you do that, the navigator is going to stay in terminal mode. It's not going to be in approach mode. So you, you would like it to be in approach mode on the outside. Uh, the other question was asked on an LPV approach, when does the glide path become active? And it, the answer is it becomes active when the final approach fix becomes the active waypoint. So we're gonna see that here in just a minute. When um, DEMPI becomes the active waypoint, when that shows up in the right-hand side of this box over here where it says Seiko right now, when we cycle to the next fix, it's gonna switch into approach mode. So in order, we see FA over here on the right, we see LNAV highlighted, we thought we were gonna get LPV, right? That's what the, it told us when we loaded the approach that we were gonna get LPV. Now it says LNAV. So this is part of the ingredient in that think checklist that I mentioned early, earlier. Think, okay, I expected to get LPV, but now I only have LNAV. What's different? And now the different is we're not gonna have a glide path indication. We're gonna have a different type of, different accuracy of navigation down final. We're not, uh, not an angular difference anymore. Now we're a fixed distance. Uh, and so for whatever reason, uh, the navigator has decided it can't give you LPV navigation today. It's going to give you LNAV navigation. And the reason is, yeah, as Greg so accurately points out, the reason on this particular one is the CFI pulled a, a nasty CFI trick and turned SFAS off. But the point here is no matter what you thought you were going to get, when you get on the approach, when you see this reverse video highlight, make sure you're getting what you thought you were going to get. We got a couple of messages in here, and sometimes a message will pop up there that you had a, an approach mode downgrade. So let's fake this thing again a little bit here. I'm going to act, actually first is um, first is I'm going to turn my SBAS back on again. SBAS is satellite based augmentation system. If you're playing along at home, basically it's uh, the ICAO answer to um, to WAS. So I turn my WAS back on. We're still outside the final approach fix, but that didn't by itself cause our approach mode navigation to revert to LPV. We're still in LNAV mode. It, once it's done that downgrade, if, if something changes, it won't change back. But what I can do is come back to the flight plan and I can, I wanna activate this leg again. Menu activate leg from Seiko to Dempi. Yeah, that's what we wanna do. We activate that. Now we're in the approach mode. Now we have LPV. When we got that LPV, we also got our glide path indication, that flag went away and we have our vertical deviation. And we can just stay at our altitude until we get on the glide path. And this is a case with this particular simulator, GPSS autopilot setup, we can actually use altitude mode and it'll maintain altitude until it gets on glide path and it'll follow it down. It'll be just like an autopilot coupled ILS approach. It's beautiful. Okay, uh, Garmin trainer on your PC, source for exercise. No, you get to just make these uh, these exercises up, Bristol. Uh, one exercise I did the other day, I jumped in our, our Redbird simulator at the airport. I just poked my thumber, my, my finger at an airport in the middle of the country, and I picked a nearby airport with an approach and just went through the procedure to load the approach and get it loaded into the G1000 on that simulator, and, uh, and here we go. Um, Let's see, I saw a moment ago there should be on your way down to 2800. Yes, you could be on your way down to 2800, uh, but the glide path was above me anyway. So why not just stay where I am? And, you know, I, I'm flying along level here. My glide path is up here. If I just fly level, then I only have one configuration change to start down. If I dive down to 2800, then I have to do that descent, I have to level off again, motor along till I get to my glide path, and then do it again. So in this way, I've done one maneuver instead of doing three, and it's easier. I'm very much a work smarter, not harder kind of guy. So we're on the glide path, as opposed to a glide slope. And our nav approach does not have a glide slope. It has a glide path. We're descending. You can see we're at 2,600 feet now. Uh, we, we're coming up on the final approach fix. So time, we're going to start our clock. Turn, we got no turn to do, but I do want to make sure my heading bug is lined up. Twist, my OBS is set. Throttle, I've reduced power to start my descent. Tires, my landing checklist is complete. Uh, my approach flaps are set. I got it down and a green light. Everything else is done. My fuel selector is on the full tank, boost pump on, whatever it is. Um, talk, so hey, Ontario Tower, 
so and so over Dempy inbound. As I cross the fix, note your altitude. I was at 2,300 feet. Uh, so the chart said 2,800. I don't know why that is. So we're at the incorrect altitude. I would be looking at that. If I was 700 feet low there, there's something going on. Uh, this is a simulator. All the settings are weird, so all bets are off. Uh, and that last thing, think. I'm doing an RNAV GPS approach, LPV minimums. That's what I have associated. Uh, my indications on my CDI, my uh, lateral and vertical guidance are good. And my LPV decision altitude is 1,220 feet. And so that's where I'm going. That's what I'm doing. Uh, Chris asked, can't I use direct to press twice to activate leg? Yes, you can. And I used to teach that. I just think it's a little bit confusing. It's too similar to the direct enter enter. Trying to paint that distinction between direct direct enter and direct enter enter was too confusing. So just to keep things a little bit more clear, I now teach to use the menu button instead and activate the leg using the menu. I think it's a little bit simple. Um, okay, and Walter says, if you hold altitude hold engage and then select nav and approach on it, will it start descent on automatically? I can't tell you what it's gonna do, Walter. It depends on your setup is all I can say. So you need to get familiar with what your autopilot says it's gonna do, what approvals you, you have on the autopilot. Uh, altimeter, maybe, Gordon, it could be altimeter, but I don't have an altimeter. I don't have a, a Colesman window to set my barometric pressure. Who knows? It, it's an autopilot thing. So I'm coming up on 1220 is my decision altitude. Now is when I look up and do I see anything on the runway? Uh, nope, I don't see anything on the runway, so I'm going to go miss. Uh, so I take it out of approach mode and I'm going to set my altitude. This is just kind of trying to make this simulator do stuff. It says it's arriving at the waypoint. And we're going to go into the same missed approach mode. Notice it. We're in suspend mode over here above the OBS button. It says suspend. Uh, we're still navigating to the missed approach point. It's not navigating the missed approach. We don't have a pink line ahead of us. So that means we have to press OBS. Now we switched into mapper navigation, missed approach navigation. And now it's going to fly this missed approach. And we go on our way. Okay, not sure glides will activate as soon as FAF becomes active waypoint. There, there are a couple, uh, Thomas is asking about that activation I said, when the final approach fix becomes the active waypoint. That's the main ingredient. There's a couple other ingredients. Your heading needs to be lined up within 45 degrees of the final approach course. And if you're on a non-WAS navigator, you need to be more than two miles from the final approach fix. In my WAS navigator, I've had success in activating it at or even after the final approach fix. And you saw us do that on that Corona approach. So there's a bunch of ingredients on that. Um, but the big one is if you're on course and everything's all good, uh, normally when the final approach fix becomes active, it does. Uh, doesn't direct, direct enter, create a 45 degree intercepted leg? Yeah, but basically that's what the autopilot's going to do, Deidre. That's a good question. I don't have an autopilot in my airplane. It, it has one, but it's <laughs> it works better as a doorstop than it does as an autopilot. So I'm kind of stuck with that. Okay, for my next trip, uh, let me put us in heading mode here and I will turn off to the south here. Um, and if you turn your hymnals to page three here, let's take a look at the RNAV GPS runway 24 at Fullerton Airport. And let me just see here. Okay, yeah, I do happen to have a, uh, a flight plan loaded for this. Let's do that. I'm gonna menu, I'm gonna invert this flight plan. So now I'm going to Fullerton and I'm going to now activate this one, doing some flight plan tricks. That was a, some stuff I talked about in the extra section, I think that I did, that's on my YouTube channel, so find that. So right now it's navigating from LAX to Fullerton and we're flying around out here in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so I wanna go through the process of loading up this approach though. So um, if we hit procedure, now when I go to select approach, it, the airport it started with is Fullerton, and it takes me now to the approach selector. So I didn't have to type in Fullerton. I activated this flight plan that had Fullerton in it. So I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to do this RNAV 24. It's got that little GPS thing there. I can select that. Do I want transition or vectors to final? And here's where I want to talk about vectors to final. And I really would discourage you from using vectors to final to the greatest extent possible. If you take a look at that approach chart, 
for a moment while we're flying along here. You'll see it starts up at Pomona, goes down to Lamy, to Haver, to Actec, and then the airport. So it's got all those fixes in there. There's a big turn at Lamy, and then there's another intersection there called Haver. If you look down at the plan view, sorry, the profile view, you'll see that there's an altitude change. We're 3,000 or above up before Lamy, and then you'll see 2,700 or above at Haver, and then 2,000 or above at Actec. So wouldn't you like to know where Haver is while you're flying along? So if we select vectors to final, it shows us ACTAC, it shows us the runway. It says it's gonna give us LNAV plus V in that lower right corner. Do we wanna load or activate? So let's just load this one. Uh, if I activate, remember it's gonna turn around and go back to, well, in this case, it's gonna put us on a 45 degree heading to intercept the final, which you know, might, in this case, not, maybe not so bad. But if I had that Pomona transition selected, it's gonna turn around and go back to Pomona. And I really don't wanna do that. So let's just load this and you see we've got, it's still navigating LAX to Fullerton and then we have the approach, but notice that it only shows us ACTAC and the runway on the flight plan page. We look at the uh, map page here and uh, we, we see this, uh, the inactive leg here that goes into ACTAC and we see this leg from ACTAC to the runway. The pink one is the one that we're still navigating from LAX to Fullerton. So, we lost, we don't know where Haver is and we don't know where Lamy is. And we might wanna know that. So if we go to procedure instead um, and we will select approach. We wanna select the same approach, but we're gonna select a different transition. We're gonna select the Pomona transition. So let's, do we start up here at Pomona? We go to Lamy, we go to Haver, to ACTAC and so on. That looks good. And we just wanna load this. We don't wanna activate it. Oh, I hit the wrong button. I wanna stop this thing here. So procedure, select approach. That's the correct approach. Transition Pomona and enter. So it takes us back to the flight plan. We see Pomona, Lamy, Haver, and so forth, just like we talked about. We get rid of the flight plan. We look at the map. We can zoom in just a little bit here. Uh, let me go ahead and turn over this direction a bit more and I'll pick up some speed. And we can talk about this. So now we see our leg from Pomona. Lay me to have her to act and that's all good, right? That's pretty much what we're going to want to do. Uh, let me continue that turn just a little bit more. And let's say ATC says we're going to vector you on to final. And uh, I'll pick up the speed so we get out there a little bit quicker. And I'll zoom in as we as we move along here. Actually, I'm going to turn just a little bit more to the right so you can see what's going to happen. I'm going to show you the way I prefer to do it is instead of activating vectors to final which remember, if we do VTF, we're gonna lose Haber, we're gonna lose Lamy, we won't know where we are on the approach. Well, you're gonna to have to do that mental math and figure out where you are so that you know what your altitude is, is going to be allowed to be. So, we're chugging along here. Let me go ahead and pick up the pace real fast. We'll go jet speeds here. I think I'm still half asleep. I just got back from Australia yesterday and my, my internal clock is still just a little bit out of whack. Um, okay, let's see. While we're doing this, we've got any other things. Um, you know, we have setting waypoint altitudes for a pseudo glide path. No, there's no way to do that with the Garmin 430 and 530. Uh, you can do that with some late models of G1000, and you can do it with the GTN uh, 650 and 750. Uh, but the 435, so if you remember, this is kind of a second generation GPS navigator. Uh, it, we're, we're lucky it can do LPV approaches, quite honestly. So that takes care of that one. We're motoring along. Uh, wow, Deirdre says she used dual 430s with autopilot in a helicopter. That's nice. It's really cool. Okay, so let's come on down here and ATC gives us a little vector and uh, we're gonna try to get on this leg. I I'm gonna intercept that final just outside of Haver is what I wanna do and notice this little green arrow is still pointing to LAX. Okay, get back down to about 80 knots or so, give or take. Okay, I'm gonna put it on this heading and uh, we're gonna activate that leg into Haver. So we bring up the flight plan, we give ourselves a cursor, scroll down here to Haver, highlight the fix that anchors the leg and it's at the end of the leg we wanna intercept, press menu and we wanna activate that leg. So we want to fly that leg from Lamy to Haver. Yeah, that sounds like what we want to do. And we look back at the map. We've got our, our pink line. It's in the right spot. 
the little green carrot is pointing right to the station. So I wanna actually head just a little bit to the left of it. Uh, and that was the question earlier, does it set up a 45 degree angle? Well, if it sets up a 45 degree angle and that angle takes you past the waypoint, depending on things, it might not sequence the waypoint for you. So we just wanna make sure that we sequence the correct waypoint. So if we uh, fly heading 180 for now, ATC will normally give you no more than uh, uh, that ATC guy's gonna correct me. I, they, they won't give you more than about a 45 degree intercept angle on it, more or less. Um, yes, I see that, Brian. I'll tell you an out-of-school out of joke about that later on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't meant for you. I was just entertaining everybody else. But I think it's a 30 degree intercept of final. Isn't that what ATC is limited to? 30 to 45. I, I don't remember which. It's somewhere in there. Uh, yeah. there. There have been times when I got more than that when the controller just forgot. And, got a, and that's ground track. So the wind has a factor on that as well. This is true. So set course to 244 is what it's telling me. That's a good idea. You want everything to, to line up and make sense. Okay. So we're, we're now, we're in terminal mode. So it's one mile deviation we're just coming into that so we're less than one mile off the the program course we're still in heading mode so here's where i'm going to go to nav mode and this is where it's going to do that intercept for us but by activating that leg instead of just activating vectors to final let me just show you real quick here so we know that we're going to be outside of haver and looking at that chart that means we cannot descend below 2700 feet yet we're, we still haven't gone past it so we can't go any lower if you did vectors to final, watch this now. If we go to the procedure and we activate vectors to final, now we don't see Haver anymore. So the question is, what's your minimum altitude right now? And we just have no way of knowing. So that's why part of why I really discourage using activate vectors to final. So I got to reselect the approach again. And the transition again. An anonymous attendee asks, auto sequencing in this situation? Question mark. Yes, it will auto sequence. Uh, it will re well. Um, let, me let me get back to where I was here. Notice that above this OBS button, it doesn't say suspend. So that means it's going to auto sequence these waypoints. Now, so we're going to get on this leg, and we're still in terminal mode. We're still terminal navigating. Uh, once this thing intercepts the final, um, the scale here is increasing now. We, so we're in terminal mode with a mile. It's coming on. It's going to start this turn. We see our, our deviation bar is starting to, to come in on the HSI. It's turning our heading. And here we go. Now, a moment ago, I told you that when the final approach fix becomes the active waypoint, it's going to sequence onto the approach. You'll see approach mode enunciated. Uh, we're going to see F F A over here next to ACTAC when it shows up. And uh, we'll be in Fat City here. It's all going to be good. Uh, we're a Category B today, so I'm, I'll try to get 115 knots so we can move a little quicker. Uh, so notice the glide slope on the sides of the HSI here. The glide slope is still off because we're in this lateral-only mode. We don't have any vertical guidance. So message says set course to 244. <laughs> Sorry about that, I had to take a quick gulp. So it's gonna to turn to 244. Oops, I got this set on the wrong course. Here we go, 244, 244. Once we cross Haver, Haver moves over here to the left side, ACTAC becomes active. That's the final approach fix. We have our approach mode enunciated. It's turned reverse video. And we got our glide slope indication on the sides of the HSI. We can put it in approach mode on this particular autopilot, or altitude mode, rather, and it will follow the, alt the uh, glide path down. So this is perfect. It's just what we want to see. Now, tell me what the NDA is for an LNAV plus V approach. Anybody want to take a guess there? You look at your chart, and you won't see LNAV plus V in the minimums box. And that's because this is a Garmin creation. This is an electronic calculated computed glide path. It has nothing to do with the chart. It's, this is a non-precision approach. And that's in the uh, MDA is 900. I like Errol. He, he listened to what I said earlier. Take that MDA, add 50 feet to it, and make that your DDA, a derived decision altitude. And now you, you've added a 50 foot margin above your MDA. You can treat that like a DA and just like an ILS and you're, you're golden. 
So some airports will have this plus V and some will not. Um, let's see, uh, Charlton asks, is it under advisory or legal for obstruction clearance? No, it's not legal for obstruction clearance. There have been cases where airplanes have hit obstacles. Now there's a Learjet going into, I wanna say it was Burlington, Vermont a couple of years ago, hit trees on the ridge because they were following the, the, this plus V glide path. So it's not legal. You need to make sure you, it's on you to verify that where you are is, is going to keep you clear of obstacles. So I wouldn't do it at night. <laughs> I wouldn't do it in an airport you're not familiar with. Um, so if, if you lost WAS, for example, if I had turned the SBAS off for this approach, we would not have plus V on the enunciation here. We would just have L now. So that's a 0 0.3 mile deviation. In fact, I can show you that, I think, here. You take it out of altitude and we'll just stay right here. And I'm going to, I'm going to fool with this thing a little bit. I'm going to take us off course and watch this course deviation indicator on the bottom here. You see, it's moving pretty quickly. We're already half scale. We haven't even turned a, 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 hardly any at all. But as soon as it reaches the edge of the cage here, it says 0.2. So it's, we, it's now we're three tenths of a mile off course. And that's how much deviation it's allowing us. So at about between 0.2 and 0.3 is where it's going to switch from a number here back to actual uh, deviation needle indication. Uh, James asked the advantage of the plus V over just a straight LNAV without vertical guidance. One advantage is that if you use it, it activates over the final approach fix on down. There might be step downs. It should your mileage may vary. It should um, protect you against the step downs inside the final approach fix. Uh, and it will give you a constant descent, a, a nice gentle standard descent all the way down. So that way it, it avoids having to do the dive and drive, which uh, I've become less of a fan of that over the years. So let's go back into nav mode here and just trying to get it on down here. And we can watch the same missed approach behavior again when we get down there to the missed approach point in another mile point six. Couldn't you legally and safely dive to 900? Yes, you could do that. Um, in, in, plus V is for stability. Yes, if you follow the glide path, you'll be a lot more stable on descent. I'm not much of a fan of the dive and drive anymore. I'd really rather do a, a consistent descent, smooth descent so that I'm not manhandling the airplane around and making huge power and, and configuration and trim changes all the way down final. I think it's just safer. Okay, oh, I didn't punch altitude. So here we are at our MDA and flying along. Okay, um, now the last approach I wanted to touch on tonight, we're already an hour and a half here tonight. So sorry about that guys, we're running along. Um, Actually, I will pick, I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to do the ILS over to Long Beach because it's real real close and I can pull it up pretty quickly here. Uh, I wanted to show you an ILS approach just because you can use the GPS to navigate a lot of aspects of a terrestrial approach. Um, oops, I keep hitting that wrong button there. Sorry about that. So I want procedure. If I stop using the, um, the mouse and just use the knobs instead, it'll probably work quicker. Okay, so I'm gonna pull up Long Beach. It's a little bit closer, to, we'll get there quicker. You can load the, even if you're doing a terrestrial approach, like an iOS approach, let's say, uh, you can use the GPS to navigate all aspects of the approach other than the final approach segment. So. Uh, you can see if we look at our map here before we load or activate the approach, we have our waypoints. We get the holding pattern over Becca. Uh, actually, let me pick a different transition here. Um, let's pick the mids transition because that's a straight in one. So as we zoom in here, you can see we got mids. We got this uh, computer fix runway three zero to uh, intercept the final. Um, and we'll go ahead and activate that in guidance only. It's not to actually execute the approach. Uh, and let's see. So I want to intercept the leg here into Becca. Actually, the, this database is so old that it, the approach has a new name now, or that, that fix has a new name. So I highlight that. I go to menu. I want to activate this leg. You want to fly that leg from that intercept into Becca. Yeah, that's good. And we can see there's Becca. There's the approach. So you could use GPS to navigate this whole thing, to do your procedure turn for you, to do your um, 
uh, intercepting any any of that stuff. You just have to make sure as you approach the um, final approach fix that you've changed over to GPS navigation. Let's see how that looks. So right now we're in suspend mode, probably because we're kind of close to that fix, but we're not anywhere. We're close down range from it, but we're not on course. And we're 4.8 miles off of it. So I'm going to pick up the pace and get over here quick. Okay. Always use track up. Yeah, Donald, I've gotten used to using track up. Just be, I, I like I like the map depicting things in the way they are out my window. Um, I, it's a little bit tough with a sectional chart because you turn it upside down if you're flying south and, and the whole chart's upside down. But on these um, navigation displays, everything's right side up. So it works well. Uh, yes, uh, Leonardo says, uh, Leonardo says, yes, they, they, uh, in this chart, in this database, it's Becca. The new one is um, Gunny. Okay, I've got a couple of controller friends who work out in this area and actually control this airspace. So they'll keep me straight, although they're not pilots. Actually, one of them is. Okay, so we're going to set our course to the uh, final approach course inbound, it's 301. Uh, so we're flying this course. I'm going to get a little bit closer. We're still a mile point six away. We're still in that terminal mode. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and slow it down a little bit. We're going to make this intercept turn inbound. I'm going to push nav so it'll intercept. So we're still in GPS mode and we can use the GPS to navigate this intercept, which might be smoother in your setup. So something to consider. Uh, we're coming up on Becca. We'll be there in a minute and a half. It's going to set up this real nice about a 45 degree intercept in here. It's a runway three zero. Yep. Uh, now this enunciates LNAV, which is kind of interesting. If you have that one, we talked earlier about that setting uh, to auto select the deviation indicator over to GPS or, or over to VLOC. Um, if you have that turned on, then it will do that. I believe it does it inside of two miles. So we still have just a little bit to go here. So let's see if this one does it. I think I have it turned off. So it didn't do it. So we're coming up on the final approach fix and we should be at 1600 feet right now. Um, Walter asks, can you only use GPS until the final approach fix on an ILS approach? Yes. Anything before the final approach fix, inbound from the final approach fix, you must be using, you must have the, navigate, the, the terrestrial navigation displayed somewhere. Maybe not necessarily coming off your 530. You could use your second, your nav two, uh, but here's how you do that. If it doesn't switch over in the lower left corner there, we see GPS enunciated over the CDI button. Just push that and we get VLOC. Uh, we can put our localizer frequency active there and the, the, uh, nav the localizers and VORs don't work very well on this particular simulator. Uh, and the glide slope certainly doesn't work. You're getting a message flipping. It was probably, I should have pulled that up right away. It was the, the message saying, look, you got to switch to a GPS navigation mode. Okay, so if we rock it down this final real fast, uh, the rest of that question was, you can use the GPS to navigate everything up to the final approach fix, and you can also use the GPS to navigate everything after the missed approach point. So you can use it to navigate the missed approach. So that's kind of handy also. Okay, so we're inside now, we're heading to the runway, we're in nav mode, it's tracking. Uh, th this would not be a legal setup unless we also had it switched there. Uh, yeah, I may have the wrong nav frequency there. So let's see, uh, will it flip now? Yeah, we still get the nav flag on the CDI, even though we have the, the correct station tune and identified here. Um, all right, so once we get to this final approach fix, which is going to happen quickly, or I'm sorry, missed approach point. So we're doing 600, 500 some knots here, so... <laughs> If you have a separate uh, VOR CDI, can you keep the 530 on GPS during the final approach course? Yes, you can do that. Uh, the, the aim now indicates that. And, and for my money, yes, you can do it. Uh, you can always use this as situational awareness. Um, okay, now we're at the missed approach point. It's in suspend mode. We can unsuspend it. We can go back to GPS. And let's slow back down and take it off a ludicrous speed. And now... It should be, yeah, here's the turn now. It's gonna navigate us out to a pattern intersection. So there we are. Um, I believe that is all I had for my notes for today. It's a good thing because we're out of time. We've gone way long again. Do we have any other questions, Brian, that I can handle here? Do you see anything interesting out of the uh, chat box there? 
I think we've been getting most of them as we go along here. Nothing outstanding. Okay. Good. Then here, let me go back to my other screen share here. I'll take it off the simulator. And so if you go to YouTube and search for my name, uh, or Brian, would you mind posting that YouTube link back in the chat again there? Um, there it is. You, you can go to that link and you can find all the earlier programs. So if you didn't see the earlier ones or you, you like the pause button, you want to watch it again, that's cool. You can share it with your fun, friends. That's awesome. Uh, and if you have any questions on any of this, here's my email address for the purpose of answering questions about this series, CaptainMikeGPS at gmail.com. Send me an email and we'll take care of it. Uh, if you want Wings credit for tonight, you don't have to do anything. Please don't send me an email. <laughs> yeah, we, we know you are here and you'll get your Wings credit. Uh, it should be there within about two weeks. I'm going to try to do it next week. I go to training tomorrow for work. Um, so if you haven't gotten it in about two weeks, then you can poke me with an email. Uh, but wait till then. Uh, if you're watching it later on the recording, uh, if you're watching it on YouTube later on, you can send me an email to this CaptainMikeFast at gmail.com. Include that number, that WP0501, I'm sorry, 0510-6545 um, in the subject line for that email. And give me a, a couple of days or a week or so to take care of that. And here is Brian's webpage for resources about this program. You can also just take that GNS 101 off the end. It's a great website for a whole bunch of other articles and videos and calendar stuff that Brian's got going on. So it's great. Yeah, thanks. And all the links that we've referred to here and all the YouTube videos and even this video, there'll be links to everything. All the links we've referred to will be on that website. Yep, you bet. It might take us a couple of days to get that all up there. Uh, if you like what you get here, you got some value of it, out of it, uh, we'd appreciate a little contribution. Uh, you can send it to Zell uh, by that email address or to Venmo, or we're using Brian's uh, PayPal account. And again, if, if you want to send us a check, just send me an email and I will send you uh, the address and where to send it. And those are also on that website. And and anything that goes over what we cover for our costs, we're donating to the 99s to help cover the cost of this. And they they put that also toward their uh, uh, um scholarship fund that they do for awarding for, for, for student pilots. Yep. Uh, so that's all I've got for tonight. Let's uh, hang up the recording right here, Brian, and, and uh, see you all for the next one. Uh, keep If you have suggestions for content for the next one, uh, we're starting to...